Welcome to the Kira Talks podcast. We've got Anya Sajdev with us of Marbridge and Navit Rakudin. Uh, she's a young entrepreneur. And as usual, you, you've got me, Ratesh, and my co-host, Aratra. Yes. So, Anya, welcome. And yeah, let's just dive straight into it. So, tell us, what is Marbridge all about? Sure. So firstly, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure spe- just talking to you guys about Marbridge and about sports business in India. So Marbridge is a, a content-based community platform. Um, so I went to the US to study and I worked there for a bit and uh, I always wanted to do something for Indian sports businesses as well. So in a sense, what I started was um, when I was seeing a lot of fragmentation in the industry, uh, you know, the industry is growing. We've had leagues in the past, but there's just so much fragmentation. People aren't talking to each other about or exchanging dialogue on the business side of sports. So I decided to start a community where I can get these stakeholders and young executives and entry-level professionals together, exchange dialogue and just build a more cohesive community based on based off of content. So we were releasing a lot of newsletters, uh, podcasts, much like yourself, um, still in the loop of doing that. And just a lot of events, again, as an offshoot to generate more content for the business side of sports. That's really interesting. What made you, so you told me that there was this uh, gap that you felt there was, right? And if you could possibly uh, put some tangible, maybe numbers or actual issues that you saw. So what was the difference? from uh, say, in the West and when you came down to India? Yeah, so in terms of fragmentation, just, um, and I'm speaking purely on the business side of things. So I saw myself attending events or maybe speaking to key stakeholders in the industry, people you'd look at and read about almost um, naturally, almost, almost very seamlessly. There wasn't too much, you know, there was just this dialogue and environment that was created for young executives and students to speak one-on-one with these executives. Um, And then when I tried to do the same thing um, while I was there with Indian executives, there was just sort of this weariness. I think the idea of networking or building a relation or perhaps even um, developing the next generation of talent for the business side of sports, sports managers or sports business business people was missing so just just weariness in conversation just apprehension of not being able to even come on the phone and speak um, maybe even for a half an hour 20 minute chat you know I'm sure you guys face that problem when you're reaching out to people for podcasts or getting people on board there's just the idea the newness which people aren't ready to adapt to and it's such a networking based industry there's relationships are just so important you know people want to refer each other because they're working days and nights with leagues and teams on projects together. So why aren't then business managers coming together? If we're trying to improve the product on the court, what's the off the court, off the field product, the managers, why aren't those guys developing? So that's kind of the, that fragmentation that I saw. And I thought, you know, maybe I could come in and create this community. Hmm. Would you, do you, do you think that we can put that down to culture? Oh, definitely. I was, uh, that's such a spot on word, honestly. I'm so glad you mentioned it because I was going to bring it up in the conversation. I think just the culture, you're right, absolutely, in, in promoting sports and sports that aren't even as commercial there. You, you know, you've got your big four leagues, but mm-hmm. even, or why do we even look at the West? Even we could look at the East as well in certain developed areas in the East. Just that promotion of, this is a dialogue with sports, you know, sports business or promoting people to play sports and, and not only running grassroots programs, but also making them more impactful. What's happening at the university level? We've got a good university level going on. I mean, I, I represented Delhi University myself and I saw that um, there's just not enough dialogue that goes on. What beyond university do you go on to play? Where do you go? There's no bridge. So I feel like that culture is just missing. You can focus on grassroots, but what about the existing channels that we currently have? So I think that's kind of where that culture seeps in. So if we can maybe get to that level, um, we can have some more change. Hmm. Now, this is, so always, uh, when we come from the background of consumer or technology products in general, and uh, I have done around nine years of uh, marketing in India, right? So. Uh, what we've seen, at least with FMCG and uh, consumer products, is uh, 
the ecosystem generally develops very independently. So we do, so most of the case studies we're looking at is Western case studies. We're looking at say, Southeastern case studies, but the way the ecosystem functions in India has mostly been independent. So do you think maybe we're getting it wrong when we're trying to still base our practices in the country from the best practices in the West? So what works in US, do you think it will still work in India? It's, this is like, a, yeah, I think it's a great question because we're always looking at the West for comparison because mm -hmm. the, their leagues have been a hundred years old and, you know, the entities have been professionalized for so long, but that's where the loophole is. I don't think mm -hmm. we need to look at them because it's been so professionalized and prevalent for years. Mm -hmm. And if we're coming in and developing the same model for leagues in India, where the IPL created this ripple effect, and now we're seeing leagues for every sport um, without a sustainable or a blueprint for those mm -hmm. athletes to even go or do something after those leagues, after their retirement or even before, where are those athletes kind of coming from? Where is that pipeline? So without developing a pipeline, we're following the West because, and, and modeling leagues off of that, just making it more entertaining and making it more suave for the fans. Um, so I think it's completely, it's not the best idea to look at the West. Uh, we can really just, I think India needs to develop the ecosystem that's prevalent already. We're improving massively in individual sports, shooting, badminton, tennis. You know, we've, we've produced champions there. We need to focus on our current infrastructure. What about the, the stadiums that were built during the Commonwealth Games? How are they being utilized? Again, the university games. Maybe we don't need another university games or another Kelo India for university. We need to first the inter inter university competitions that we've already been having, the All India University Championships, which are very coveted. How are we scaling those up? So I think if we can then start developing and polishing those current entities, that's where the improvement at the culture will start developing versus just following a model that's been professionalized for years. Uh, you are a young entrepreneur now. You take new steps to the world of uh, sporting business quite recently. Uh, what would you say are the major challenges for someone trying to get into this business, especially in India? Uh, you've worked in the West. You've seen how much more developed it is. Uh, it's probably more seamless, easier to get into the entire working culture over there. Uh, what would your advice be to someone trying to get into the business over here? Yeah, absolutely. Um, as an entrepreneur, I think just patience is extremely important and that probably applies to entrepreneurs everywhere all over the world, but especially entrepreneurs in the sports business side of India. I think just be aware that your dialogues will not be as seamless when you'll be reaching out to people or when you'll be trying to promote your service or your product. It's going to be a lot of back and forth and it's really, it could get really frustrating because you're trying to promote a very simple idea, a very simple service, and you're trying to help the other person in a sense, right? The community that I'm trying to build is not for me, it's, it's for the people. But there's a lot of back and forth that goes on even there. Um, the idea of coexistence is not um, extremely um, stable in India yet. I feel like a few entities doing the same thing if there are other entities trying to release or develop events and communities, it's, it's a good thing. So I think just that coexistence is okay and to be aware that other people can come in and do that. Um, people can take a bit offense to that. So I think that coexistence may not exist. So just be wary of that. But what is amazing is that off late, um, once it takes off, so I've now hosted an event, I've released a couple of newsletters and now the dialogue, once you, I think, can um, selflessly give your service to somebody, the dialogue really opens up. It changes the level playing field, really. Um, you know, the kind of response now that I've been getting more than ever has proved to me that it's probably um, a very sustainable idea or concept to just develop, the, develop more on the business side of sports. So I think it's just that openness that takes a little bit of time. And that's a challenge that people should expect. But eventually things will just work in your favor if you keep at it. Just to play devil's advocate over here. So we also do invest in sports uh, <clears throat> technology products, but then uh, the dearth of good technology coming out of the country right now, we, we have to 
essentially go and look after sports IP and a lot of other event-based uh, properties as well. From the investor side, and I've spoken to so many investors today in the market, at least in India, right? And mm-hmm. you need deployment of patient capital. Now the question is, how patient does the capital need to be? Because Indians have always figured, na ek rupee adala, mujhe dey rupee banna hai. If that's not happening, I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm hoping you're cool with Hindi, right? No, no, this is okay. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> point then being that how patient does the capital need to be, and who shows them this path? Because there is nobody to show them the path, right? So entrepreneurs don't know where the products are going. They start off being a product, they become a service within the first year. So, as an as an investor, then what does the investor do? And, and I think this is something that even international investors, when they're trying to come into India, have this question. Where is the path? Is there actual money to be made? There's, I think there's definitely money. We can see that in the recent companies in tech that have become unicorns. Um, they're, creating, they're creating immense ripple effects across the industry. But just like you said, there's lack of patience. Um, investors want to come in and, and reap the benefits out of sports or sports business. You need to realize that you need to take it extremely slow um, and strategize extremely well for the Indian market. What may apply to your product or service in another country will absolutely not, may not, sorry, may not work in India. It's an extremely complex market, a lot of diversity, um, different price points. Um, different shadows of society. So you need to really strategize your product where you can't make it um, as seamless or as universal for the entire country. It needs to be extremely strategized. And I, I do think that if you can define your vision and your objective according to your strategies for the short term and long term, you can investors and entrepreneurs can really succeed in that dimension. Uh, and that's where your patience fits in. Um, Decathlon, for example, I just kind of want to give the example is they're, they're beating all the top or major retailers that go on to perform so well in India. And it's probably because they strategize very differently for the Indian market. They developed key um, ideas that, that fit into the market, the way they had priced their products and their services or the way they run their services. You can go walk into Decathlon store anytime, interact. It's an ex- extremely experiential um, retail company for India. So that's something if I think that's a model that people can maybe incorporate. True. And, and if you look at, uh, so the other thing that happens is India is a very uh, cost-centric market, right? So uh, it, the price dictates whether I'm going to buy that product or not, which is for a consumer product, be it a technology product. And where people have actually seen the sweet spot is generally anything below 500. The moment your product is above 500, People are going to think twice. So it becomes a high involvement purchase. I don't know how his, it was 600 buck or product or high involvement. Yeah. Purchase, but it is how it is in India, right? And if you see, and if you hit the nail on the head when you said Decathlon, one is their numbers, they've, they've outdone the Nikes and the Panikas yeah. of the country. Now, what we have seen, I know this is something we have seen particularly being in this industry for quite some time now. The customer... Even though they want quality, so they don't want to pay for quality. So your vendors are not going to be able to supply quality. And so let me give you an example. Uh, one of the products that we work on is infrastructure. Right now, uh, if you look at the price points of any good product that comes out of, say, Europe or, say, America, and if you want to land that in India, it will be at least 2x the price of any product that comes out of China. Now, the issue with Chinese products is there are no uh, regulations guiding how the products need to be developed. So there is no gold standard over there, whereas in Europe, there is a standard, right? So if I look at uh, products that have to do with uh, football, so there is a FIFA standard that needs to be followed. How much importance do you think education plays? Like, and I know, and Mobridge has tried doing this, right? So all the content that you guys release also has centered about educating the people. It's not random scoop whoopy content, right? So you're not reporting stuff. You're talking about how can people make their money? What's the ecosystem like? And so how much emphasis do you think needs to be put on education? And who does the onus fall on? All right. So that's a loaded question. It's yeah. a lot. <laughs> um, so just to be clear, so it's education on the business side of sports. Yes, uh, and- absolutely. Yeah, um, 
All right. I think one trend that I just want to, it just while you were speaking is one trend that I've been noticing is um, everybody wants to go abroad to educate themselves. <laughs> um, so when we just talk about education, we're just talking about two very different things, whether it's educating yourself in India to work in the Indian market or educating yourself abroad to come back or educating yourself abroad to stay there and work there. Just like, yeah. No, uh, you, can, you can finish. But um, so I, I think firstly, um, anybody who's trying to educate themselves about the market and firstly, I'm going to start with entry level professionals and students. Um, and then go on to, you know, the mid-level executives kind of looking for a transition. So these entry-level professionals and students firstly need to define a niche for themselves in what they want to do in the industry. Everyone just wants a sports management degree because they think a degree is just merely going to get them a job. With, but that's the hardest part. The degree is the fun part of it. So you can do a degree, you can do read from thousands of resources online. But how do you incorporate that into what you enjoy doing? Whether that's sports marketing, whether that's technology, whether that's working in AI, whether that's, you know, different industries in sports. So they need to educate themselves with respect to what their niche is. And I think that's just going to change the game completely because if you're in, encouraging talented and sought out individuals to enter the market who know that the defined area and the defined niche, it's really going to help companies create a proper structure for professionalization and change the dialogue on how entrepreneurs, incubators, um, and, and different stakeholders need to come together. Um, and you know, that's, that's my two cents of education. That's where the onus falls mm -hmm. on. It's people need to kind of, whoever's going for these sports management degrees, just make sure you can combine that with a niche that you're already good at and then combine that with your sports management degree. Um, that's going to change the dialogue massively and education is obviously going to play a major role in in the future right um but also at the same time i don't think just going for a degree is the ideal solution whereas we talk about education um i think just working with good entities speaking to a lot of people which is why i try to create a community or do events is because you can literally walk into a room where you have like-minded individuals Educate yourself with just dialogue, which is their experience, you know, talking like this face to face with what the right solution is going to be. That's where that's another aspect of education that needs to be encouraged in India. And I don't see much of that. It's just people are doing their thing and they may have they may talk once in a while, meet at one summit. But there needs to be a constant dialogue, constant engagement, constant uh, cohesiveness. And that's another aspect of education that I think should, should be encouraged. So actually, I was talking about that part of education. But okay. it's good that you actually spoke about the workforce because they form the base of the pyramid, right? So if you do not have good people to work in the industry, good things are not going to come out. So my question was actually that. Where, uh, so stuff like, say, when you were at Columbia, and if you had to discuss the Indian sports ecosystem with an American who doesn't know what's happening in India, where would you point them to? I, there is no repository of information today where I can go check out and read, right? There are some behind paywalls, but then again, the, the information is not good enough. So th that's the way, that's what the question was. And good that you actually ended up answering that as well. But chats need to start happening, right? People need to know uh, what's happening, how the industry is coming up. If they do want to invest, what's, what's going to happen? And I mean, it's surprising. So we, we run our consumer technology incubation center. We run two cohorts. And we've been pretty successful doing that. That's why we came into the whole sports scene. So we said, hey, you know what? Let's try and do this for sports. And we've been doing it for 18 months now. And we're finally talking about starting off a sports tech acceleration program, right? right. But I myself know it that after a point, these companies might actually have to go abroad, right? Because the market in India is not mature enough. So if you look at analytics as a product, right? And if you look at, uh, say, football analytics, in-game football analytics, there isn't enough infra right now in India to even test out the projects, right? So, which is where most of the Indian companies to even ask, we are partnering with international organizations. So, testing of products can happen. So, what what you're trying to do with Mugridge, uh, do you think more of these players now need to start coming into the market where the way we look at entrepreneurship is, so that somebody can come buy it from me and use it. But what about businesses that want to come in? What about investors that want to come in? There's no product for them right now. 
no absolutely uh you yeah you absolutely hit the right points um we need to like there's no exact repository or resource that we can direct people to they they need i think but what we're seeing in my conversation in the us or maybe interaction with stakeholders in europe or even in the eastern side is people want to invest the eyeballs are in india so they want to come to india for these eyeballs the massive population they want to develop models and reap the benefits off of other sports just the way they have from cricket um but then i think it just goes back to that those two key words that we spoke about again and again just the culture and that the uh the fact that it needs a lot of patience um so kudos to you guys that you guys are actually now are starting something you've built something and you're in, incorporating all of these entities together there are a lot of other entities that are doing this upon my conversation with investors as well in the indian sports industry they're having incubators they're having dialogues we need to encourage it more um i think that's right now what we can do is just encourage this more and uh investors that are i think also just to try to shift the focus a little bit or resources a little bit from um what is already niche or what is already saturated in the country to things that need to be developed so i see a lot of dialogue on grassroots development in india and it's i feel like there are so many entities doing so many things uh but is it impactful how are you trying to incorporate uh newer technology new innovation newer trends into those grassroots developments you know you just don't want to any random school in india by default for a by default of our population is already coaching 1000 kids right mm -hmm. if you're trying to create the same grassroots program but coaching 1000 kids you're just comparing you're literally you've just built the same thing without an academic foundation mm -hmm. so how do you make those impactful how can you incorporate technology and different incubators into these areas and make saturated areas expansive you know create a different ocean create a different strategy out of what is saturated mm -hmm. sure uh well uh, when you mentioned entrepreneurs trying to create a difference here i mean uh, you were trying to create a difference here uh but uh, right now i uh, i have not wrong you are at rakuten right now in japan right mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm. how do you plan to continue creating a difference in the indian ecosystem from afar uh and how do you plan to navigate those challenges again from afar because being here being in the sport ourselves we can see that there are a million number of challenges and it's not easy at all and we are here it's still difficult uh so it's going to be even more difficult for you right how do you plan to you know take on all of this yeah absolutely um that's a, such a valid question because of course i'm not going to be physically present in india all the time uh but so i i i was prepared for this i started my bridge while while i was in new york um and then i came back and kind of took my time to develop it further being in the market and now that i'm in tokyo working with rakuten um i think by the time this podcast will be out i've i would have started my first day so to say um but i was prepared for this i was prepared that i am going to be abroad and this is going to happen so the idea with marbridge was any way to make it a more digital platform because how do you encourage a dialogue between people who are in delhi and then those who are in the sports and entertainment industry in bombay or in or in bangalore for that example we want to create more virtual chats more of a digital platform where you're just constantly connected with each other right use usage of resources that are already present like linkedin massive massively used in the us massively used in the west a great tool for people to connect with and genuinely build a relationship off of that platform how can marbridge take that model do it for india um also we've had a couple of collaborative events uh, which you will see in the future where we're having events and i don't necessarily need to be present for all of them i think the event is just for the community and we're going to be having collaboration with other entities that also want to do similar things uh by hosting a lot of events in different cities um it anyway would have been, wouldn't have been possible for me to be in all those cities so i think just the idea is to then make other people rally for your cause because what you're trying to do and what the story i'm trying to tell is the story that's going to at the end influence people uh to come and help marbridge grow help the community grow so it's really just um 
helping people rally my cause honestly at this point um, you know collaborating with them helping them in a sense helping the community and hopefully that helps small bridge grow as well they count us in for that cause <laughs> we've been to <laughs> <trying laughs> the same yeah, but so what interesting thing that you said right so uh, you spoken to uh, people uh, in the western markets as well and i think in the next few months and years you're going to talk to people from the southeast asia or asian markets in general what's their sentiment when they think about india so you said people want to come in because there are eyeballs do they know these eyeballs don't want to pay yeah yeah it's uh it's they know there's absolutely difficult a lot of difficulty in getting to the market um i think when they speak about the indian e- sports ecosystem it's still cricket the buzzword is still yeah, cricket and even though we've changed massively and the changes are pre- prevalent fans are engaging more than ever with tennis in india you know some of the ma- most massive following for these tennis stars comes from indian fans mm-hmm. so I think if we're trying to speak, there needs to be a very strong liaison in India that is genuinely focused on bringing or bridging the gap between the West and the East. You know, we just don't want to get the West to India or the Southeast Asians to India um, just because you know it's a foreign entity that can come to India, pump in some money, but with no returns, with no ROI. You want to be patient in bridging that gap, bridging that relationship, just being very honest with your. being very honest with your conversations that this is kind of going to be the blueprint define your strategies for the short term and the long term because the indian market is changing in the sports industry of course changing so rapidly your short term and long term in even the next 2 to 5 years not going to be the same sure. so helping foreign entities define that we need cer- certain strong liaisons i think if you guys are already doing that with your tech incubators if you know i can come in and do that by already having a sense or a pulse of what the community in india thinks and how they work and then seeing how the west works or how the southeast asian market works and then bridging that gap that could maybe change the game a little bit um so yeah they want they know their eyeballs but they know how difficult it is and they're constantly looking for ways to get in so we need liaisons we need change makers to do that true true Well, when you're talking about these brands again, and then lot, a lot of times it comes down to money. Uh, brands want to pump in money, as you mentioned, and they want ROI. But again, uh, without developing a community, without helping out, it's not going to happen. So uh, beyond just looking at uh, liaisons and beyond just looking at uh, you know connecting with the people, what else could brands do to make an impact in India? Yeah. Um... i think is one thing definitely is fan engagement we just don't define markets very well uh what may work for certain set of fans may not work for other fans so i think fan engagement is just so important just incorporating the newer trends that are coming into the market and how to use those to engage your fans currently so like i gave tennis as example we follow those athletes massively but are we getting any returns from following them apart from just maybe going through their social profiles on instagram or scrolling through you know their latest developments what's happening for the indian audience you can definitely create a lot of brand value at least and tell a great story for sponsors by utilizing these fans if you know how to use them and monetize them for brand value that's where maybe if not on the monetary terms maybe the monetary terms can come in the long term but in the short term you can definitely tell a great story for sponsors using these fans which are already spread across widespread across india it's a very interesting point here so um, we were with some super fans right from a few uh, supporters clubs based out of bombay last week and uh, some of them have had amazing experience man like yeah one of the guys i still yeah. actually are getting goosebumps when i say this there was a manchester city fan okay very difficult to find them in india one hmm. second he was flown down to manchester uh he was he played at etihad he was with the starting 11 uh when they lifted the trophy but pictures with them and uh, played on the surface with the legends walked back to the dressing room and had a jersey with his name right there was a girl from dortmund who was flown oh, down yeah. to thailand once for an activation um then she was flown down to germany met all the players did a christmas dinner with them so yes people are now finally starting to realize that hey these fans need to be engaged and it's it's actually very sad that indian 
brands do not engage the fans so much. So I think IPL have gotten it slightly right when I say they're doing fan parks. So at least there's some form of basic engagement happening here. Uh, in football, there's not a lot, right? So, uh, so I, I agree with what you're saying with tennis, right? And it's very surprising that tennis and F1 are possibly amongst the top five viewed sports in the country, right? And uh, phew, we've not really had good tennis players. We've had a few doubles players. F1, we've had a couple of guys here or there, never really won a race. So then, I'm, this might be, <clears throat> I might be absolutely wrong when I say this, but the way I look at tennis and F1 is um, most of the people following these sports come from privilege. So for them, <clears throat> spending money is not a, a big issue. But when you're looking at mass sports, right, and how do you then get money from that ecosystem, which is what I feel everybody today is waiting to answer that question. And how do you make money out of it? Which brings me back to the point that I was talking about, right? So uh, eyeballs that don't want to pay. So yeah. I, I was having this chat, I remember, with an esports team uh, I think last, last week. And uh, they said, hey, there was uh, probably the two biggest esports players from the country. I think for CS or Dota, I don't remember. They had like, they had come up to some mall and they were playing a friendly game. And then there were apparently around 100 or 200 people that had lined up just to like, be able to meet them, right? And I said, if you put a gate out there and you charge them 50 bucks, how many people are still going to be yeah. staying? Nobody, right? Yeah. Well, I, I wouldn't say nobody anymore. Um, mm. I, I think I think it's changing a lot. We want watch parties. We want viewing parties. You know, the uh, NBA has been doing these at, at different restaurants. They've been they've changed their schedule massively to fit according to the Indian schedule. Um, you know, so we're having we're seeing a lot of audiences on TV um, watching these sports or engaging with or buying the NBA League Pass even in India to to watch the games. So um, I think it's definitely, I think pricing points will play a major difference. But you, we have to be really ingenious. As in India, we do a lot of jugaad anyway. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to be extremely ingenious with the way we engage these fans. You know, we have economies of scale. So we don't need to charge an exorbitant amount for a few fans. We can charge an absolute basic amount for a massive set of fans and maybe build models around that. So uh, we just need to be open about about how the Indian model of um, generating revenue for sports is going to be very different from how it's generated otherwise. Interesting that you mentioned the Indian activation because the price point for that was literally on the higher side, yet people went for it. But then again, that was a once in a while thing, probably the first time it's ever happened. Yeah, the first time. Like yeah. when we so the that's the reason why people were willing to pay. But if it's something that is happening regularly, do you think people would actually want to pay that big an amount? And if not, uh, if it's not attracting the audiences, what would the brand strategy be? Yeah, um, I think you need to match it with anything that's offline. NBA or any of these foreign leagues coming to India have a massive disadvantage because they don't have a product. Also, logistically, it could be a nightmare to organize mm -hmm. games or in-season games every now and then in India. So, that's kind of where brands need to come in and say, okay, what can we do otherwise experientially uh, by bridging that online and offline gap? So, you're offering a product online, you're asking fans to watch these games, but they'll only watch them if, one, they play the sport or um, they've massively interacted with, with these uh, players, with these athletes. So we need to maybe have more experiential events, offline events where we can, you know, fan parks for the, that example. Or I walked, I interned at Madison Square Garden in, in New York as well. And what I saw massively was a lot of activations, just a lot of, and activations happening every day, not for executives, also for them, but majorly for fans, right? So, you know, whether it's, it's offering freebies, it's offering, you know, uh, things to fans that make them closer to your team. Um, Chelsea FC did that recently where they started a show separately segmenting Indian fans very separately and, and that created a very emotional story so we need to have certain, these offline activations where we can help these fans or pinch them emotionally which then draws them back to those to, or make, converts them to a paying consumer in my opinion True. and it's easier than it sounds but of course it, take, it will take its time so and that's the whole thing. You need to be very, very patient with the way this ecosystem comes up. And it's it's true about any industry. It's going to 
take its time to come up. So you've grown up in India, right? And then you yeah. went abroad for studies and then you came back for a bit. So you understand the Indian ecosystem. Uh, in sports, is there something that you're absolutely bullish on? That, you know, hey, I know this is going to work. Ooh, um, this, honestly, this may be, this, you may have heard of this, but I think we need to stick with individual sports right now. I think we can produce Olympic champions if we focus a lot on these individual sports that we already have um, world champions in. Um, definitely attaining, attaining um, gold medals or at the Olympic level or world, le world level wouldn't, wouldn't be hard if we focus on them. But I think one thing, because basketball is really close to my heart, I grew up playing the sport, represented my state, this and that. But in basketball, I do feel if we focus um, on women's basketball, mm. you know, women's sports in general, just the ability to bridge the gap is easier. So if we can focus on women's basketball and develop that, uh, you know, with even academies or even sending more women players abroad, Honestly, it can open up a new market for basketball in India massively. And women's sports, of course, eyeballs are very late to follow. We've seen that. Um, we have to be honest about this conversation. But again, it's going to open the dialogue and the culture for basketball and just promoting women's sports in general. You know, People talk about women's sports as a diversity word or a buzzword. But you really, if you really want to make a difference, focus on women's sports going abroad, the ability to bridge that gap is easier, it's faster, it's, it's going to be more effective and a lot of brands are going to latch onto that. So it's going to be a win-win for a lot of people. True. You spoke about basketball, right? So I know NBA has been trying to come into the country and MLB is actually coming, like they've been trying, right? And do you see any parallels with how uh, baseball picked up in Japan? And do you see any parallels with maybe baseball picking up in the country? What they they basically get on the fact is, ah, when they cricket play, then it's so much different. It's the way it's a very similar sport. Somebody's throwing a ball, I'm hitting with a bat. So, do you see baseball picking up in the country? Um, I'm not sure about that. I I personally don't think so. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm being wary with this because you know, I mean, MLB has been running for a while and they know how to run a league. Um, but the Indian market is very different and cricket is, is a religion for us, right, in India. So to compare the two sports, it's not apples to apples. It's, it's very different. Um, this, the sport, in fact, the league is not gaining enough traction in the U.S. either, right? It's existent in Japan, but the majority of the population in Japan that watches these games belong to a very older generation. Mm -hmm. They're not your millennial, they're not your Gen Z watching this sport. So, and that's the majority of population in India. We've got the youngest population in the world. So, to engage such young fans with a sport that they have no emotional connection with um, or that's extremely novel and, frankly, uh, formatted in a way that's going to proceed for hours. You know, cricket went on to... Mm -hmm. Cricket was extremely nimble in converting from test cricket and ODI to T20 and that's kind of revived cricket as well for the country in the past few years. Um, and if baseball maybe can strategize differently for India, if at all, and they'll have to do that globally, maybe yes. But as of now, in the, for me, maybe it's not the uh, best comparison and I don't think it may take off um, so early on. But mm. I guess time will tell. So, but judging from what you said, it seems like baseball may well be on its you know, last legs. I don't say that, man. We invited somebody from the MLB over next week. I mean, that's what it sounds like, isn't it? I'm not going to comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you mentioned a very interesting word over there. Um, emotion, right? So, uh, does a person feel emotionally connected to a sport? Right? This might sound like a slightly long rant. Just bear with me, please, okay? <laughs> so, if you look at the way cricket came up, right, and... Uh, if you see the scenes around when Sachin retired, I've seen grown ass men cry on that day, right? It's because the way I felt it, the burgeoning middle class of the country, sorry, dreams of spit hope the Like we've never been world beaters. Like we've never been world beaters. So when a man from the country, and especially a tiny little man from the country, is going out there and actually being the best, right? So all the all of people's dreams from the country were on his shoulders, right? So 
When he did well, the country felt good. When he did bad, the country felt sad. When he retired, people cried, right? Now, coming back to the topic of emotion, right? So we need to have a connect with the sport. We need to have a connect with the players. If you see how Kabaddi is done very, very well, right? Nobody thought Kabaddi would do well. Leagues have sprung up for Kushti as well. Um, yeah. Cricket, again, is a sport that's played maybe in 12, 13 countries, at least majorly. And cricket picked up once we won the World Cup. So, anybody now trying to set up a new league, because everybody's trying to set up a new league, right? Just man, yeah. you're a table tennis league, you're doing an e-sports league. You might have a goddamn Coco League coming up next. You never know, right? When people want to see this stuff. What comes first, do you think? Do you think the success comes first, which then creates the ecosystem? Or is it giving products to the people that they can relate to emotionally, like a cover team, when it's a sure shot success? Hmm. So, you know, it's a chicken-egg situation. You don't know what needs to come first. But with Kabaddi, I think, apart from the emotional success, I think it's also the format. It's extremely fast. It's very entertaining. Um, so, you know, while maybe we have we had played Kabaddi back in back when we were kids, um, we hadn't played the sport in a while. So, maybe the emotional success really went down. But what really revived the league was its quickness, its format, you know, the the way trends are moving, we see a loss in attention. We aren't able to focus for a very long time, which is maybe why sports like baseball and cricket needed to revive themselves in that sense. So I think that's something if leagues can focus on, make it extremely entertaining at the same time um, and, and just incorporate a newer format for a certain type of league in India, that perhaps would help them um, engage more fans. And of course, the emotional aspects need to come in. But um, the, the one thing that I find with leagues for a long-term success, and this is my opinion, is that if in order to sustain themselves and if they can create a pipeline, and I mentioned this in our first, my first few answers, was creating a pipeline, a solid pipeline where you're involving these athletes from, okay, out of school, out of college, into a league, or out of national level tournaments into a league, and then where are they going from that league, and not expand into teams very fast, you know, focus on your cities, strategize for your cities very well. Which are the cities that one are going to have fans that are going to pay and does not have to be metropolitan cities, really has to work with your league strategy, your league's fans. So, fan engagement, fan segmentation. I think th those are the key points that help leagues really do well in India. It's quite interesting you say strategize for cities and for for regions because in our previous podcast, Neil mentioned something really similar, mm -hmm. strategize for cities. So it seems like this is something the industry should be focusing on. Yeah, I wish uh, more people listen. Oh, yeah, okay. exactly. Going smaller would be, you know, the way forward perhaps instead of always going bigger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hyper-local. I mean, the yeah. more hyper-local the scene becomes. Yeah, you, you just, just like a turf? Just like a turf. Right? <laughs> yeah. So if you talk about... Uh, Creating this, uh, you know, so creating a path for, say, a grassroots player, right? So, if you say we talk about a footballer in Kolhapur, right? And Kolhapur mm -hmm. burgeoning footballing scene right now. Yeah. And say there's a 17 year old kid who's doing absolutely amazing in football. Where does he go? And uh, so, I, I remember speaking to the guys from Cricket Australia. They actually run a program in India. It's very surprising because BCCI doesn't have a program, right? So, you have individual. Ex cricketers running academies, but the BCCI doesn't have a branded academy in the country. Mm -hmm. Whereas a Cricket Australia has a branded academy in the country. And it's a very simple program they run. It's a seven year old program. Nobody in sports does that in the country, right? But I came up for standard my joint career, it's a 10 year program. But for sports, it's never a 10 year or a seven year program. Uh, do you see or do you also feel physical education and the way we've imparted it needs to change? And have you seen? What kind of best practices have you seen in the Western countries where students are taken on at a certain age, given a path, they know if I do well over the next seven years, I can go represent maybe a club, There's a, or I can go represent my country. So do you think that needs to change as well? Uh, yeah, 100%. Um, I think we need to have more specialized academies. Hmm. Um, for involving you know, or incorporating these talents and taking them to the next level. But at the same time, and a lot of people don't focus on this, is uh, we're developing now newer universities to just for sports management. You must have heard of these, uh, the recent news articles that might have come out. 
you know, instead of focusing or creating newer academies, mm-hmm. why aren't we establishing and polishing the current academies? You know, mm-hmm. we do have a lot of existing pipelines in our school systems in India, um, in our college systems in India, mm-hmm. where athletes play national level tournaments, they're nationally ranked. Um, not all of them make it to the international scene or not all of them make it to the national Indian team, but they're representing the states. Um, how are those things being scaled? You know, do you just want a university athlete to then extend his education by taking up a PG or a diploma course for another two years, three years, because he or she wants to play sports and they know that after that three year, four year degree in India, there's no way they, they're able to play that sport because they're probably not good enough to play for the Indian national team or maybe not good enough to go abroad. Mm-hmm. So, so what's the, what are you doing in the current system? I think there needs to be some polishing in the current system, just creating a more solid culture and a foundation, you know, incorporation of data and analytics. Now, where is that's a, that's a major chunk that's missing. I don't, I don't think I can go back and get my score sheets out. I, you know, yes. from the ma- uh, like n number of tournaments that I've played, um, and that irks me because myself and my my teammates we don't know our averages, we don't know a lot of the key stats that are missing that could actually propel us to improve further. Um, and now technology is at our doorstep. You know, it's now in, in the hands of our phones. The NBA is bringing apps like Home Court, where you can literally scan using AI. You can literally scan uh, your performance in real time. Why aren't we using free softwares like that in our universities? So let's change the dialogue from within instead of kind of creating more programs, more specialized institutions. Um, yeah, I think that's going to be my two cents on this. Hmm. So now you said right that oh, for a player in India, right, there's no after a point, there's no opportunity to maybe go abroad, right? So if we keep the finances aside and say there are scholarships that are happening. Are there channels open today? So, uh, because in the country today, if you see, and say, let's take the example of what the biggest leagues that we have are cricket. It's still what the T20 league that we run has around 10 teams. Uh, Ranji, there are a lot of states represented. Football, again, there are quite a few leagues running, but there is no end goal, right? I mean, the topmost league runs for five months. So, what does an athlete do for the next seven months? And a lot of Rules in the Western countries stop Indians from getting work visas, right? So, a footballer in India can't play in Europe because you have to be in the top 50, right, as a country. 75? 75, 50 in some countries. I think UK has 50. Uh, mm-hmm. In some countries of 70, this is why a uh, guy could go play at Sun. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Sun. But the point then being, see, you are today sitting in Tokyo and you're trying to bridge this gap. We are sitting in India and we're trying to do the same, right? We're working with our international partners convincing them, showing them the India story, getting them to India, getting them to invest. Can we also start doing these athlete exchange programs where uh, athletes are not just taken for say two weeks. Okay, so we have these exchange programs which end up being tourism. Like, <laughs> but there's no uh, transfer of knowledge happening. Um, so is, is it possible? So say, uh, say if you were at Colombia, right? And, uh, um, I, I don't know about the scene over there, but I know NFL is pretty big and it has an active uh, university uh, scene, right? So, which is something that Kalo India is trying to do now, where they're trying to make university sport big. Do you think we can start having channels for Indian players to go out and play their trade in international countries? Absolutely, 100%. And, you know, let's. So, of course, we need to have more of an exchange in culture and more of an exchange for them to kind of go abroad and make use of facilities, training, bring that back. But also on the business side, if, you know, key stakeholders can come together and create funds for athletes, can we get brands to rally the cause of athletes? Not all athletes are going to make enough money to sustain themselves, right? And that so to either sustain that training, but even if they've sustained that, what do they do? They ha- have enough resources to sustain themselves after they've retired. So, uh, to but but they have a lot of skill sets, right? They've competed at various levels. People value athletes, even if you're an amateur athlete. They just value the discipline and the the uh, key characteristics that an athlete brings to the table. So can we use those characteristics to develop entrepreneurship for these athletes? 
after their retirement? Can we create more funds? There are a lot of entities, there are a few entities that are um, educating athletes who are currently playing. Even I think Colombia does that too now recently and a lot of other institutions are now trying to collaborate with athletes. Uh, Harvard does this. They, they have a massive program for athletes um, to coach them, to help them become entrepreneurs, invest in tech, uh, invest in newer properties, and then reap those benefits. They have a leverage, they have a name. Um, how can we then help them uh, sustain themselves after their careers as well? That's something I constantly think about and I want to do as well on the more social business side of sports. It's quite interesting you mentioned that because just recently uh, there was this news coming out that uh, one of India's finest commentators, Novi Kapadia, uh, yeah, his tenure with DU was done and he isn't being paid his uh, pension. Yeah. yeah yes. And he's been uh, the only reason he's able to live on, you know, sustain himself is because of help from his students, because of help from people outside. So it's essentially like. Uh, having to rely on a GoFundMe or something, I would say yeah. that yeah, that's a that's a parallel I would draw. So, is the Indian system fundamentally broken? What needs to change here to help some help these people out? Because why would someone go into the sporting business or the sporting side of things if this is what waits for them when they exit it? Yeah, it just draws me back. Absolutely right. It just draws me back to my previous point: is we need to polish the systems that exist internally right now instead of creating newer ones uh, you know you can again you're just creating programs without impact you know you're just creating another school uh, another entity another you, but what are you doing for the current system that exists you know for these university athletes for people playing massively or performing massively in school um, how are they being nurtured uh, you know uh, there may not be enough gap between um, a 10 year old or a 13 year old in India and a 10 year or 13 year old playing a similar sport abroad. But then that gap just multiplies as you grow older. You know, that incorporation and that current system of tech, data, analytics, or just current resources. And this does not need a lot of funding, it just needs um, streamlining, right? It just needs people to kind of come together and then streamline the process and say, let's take it, start from one. You know, when we talk, we spoke about cities. So, um, Auli, I spoke to Shiva Keshavan, he's from, uh, you know, he spoke about winter sports existing in India. Uh, certain areas in India, Manali, Auli, you know, these areas, why can't we develop more athletes for winter sports in, in from these cities? Focus on another city where we can develop perhaps more athletes, streamline them. Orissa is now kind of becoming that city where they want to develop athletes. So yeah. that kind of should be the strategy, you know, internally fixing things and then uh, seeing and then moving naturally. True, sure. and you very interesting point you were talking about, raised about um, say this ecosystem coming up in say Himachal, right? So India has a ice hockey team. Very few people know about this, right? So and uh, it's surprising, right? It, it reminds me of this movie where there was a Jamaican sledge bobsledge team, bobsled team, mm -hmm. and there was it was a real story, right? So a bunch of Jamaicans reach uh, Winter Olympics and they have yeah, a bobsled yeah. team, right? So. It was be similar surprising, similarly surprising when India has a, a, a an ice hockey team. Oh, yeah, really interesting. And so I'm going to come back to one point that you said, and it, it irks me as well that there's no analytics, there's no data, so you cannot go back, say, uh, ten years and see how good you were when you were playing uh, for your university, and it, it still prevails today. And the biggest issue is one is obviously. You can't see your own records, but the second is there's no scouting happening. So today, if there is a good talent that's working and playing in Mizora, me sitting in Bombay, there's no way I can know about him. So unless and until somebody sends me a video, and even if he does send me a video, how do I how am I supposed to know if he's really good? Can he consistently maintain this? So now we've had people coming in, but yeah, I, mean, I agree with what you're saying that we need to have these kind of tools, uh, one to scout to showcase talent and scout the right way, right? So accessibility is also an issue, isn't it? Uh, it is, right? I mean, accessibility is a big issue and accessibility to everything. There's no yeah. technology accessibility, there's no accessibility yeah. to... Uh, I mean, talent, we say that we do not create F1 drivers or, you know, F1 racers, yeah. But, I mean, how does, it, how does a common man get access to those things? I mean, you, <laughs> you can't, right? You can't, I mean, come on. 
locking system. Stare out of the window, all you see are potholes. Yeah, man. Doesn't make your dream about going at 300 kilometers. No, it's not going to happen. No. True. 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 Hey, uh, Neva, thank you. Thank you so much, Aramiya, for doing this. It was a really interesting chat. And we'll do, so we generally, what we do is, uh, once we've had a chat with somebody, uh, we tend to follow it up in, say, another three to four months. To see okay. if things have actually moved, you know. Yeah. So we've spoken about a few things today. Let's revisit this chat, say maybe in four months, and see if things have actually moved. And that that gives us the whole barometer, and we are understanding whether shit yeah. is actually moving or we're just sitting here and talking about things. Hopefully, the needle is moving forward slightly. Hopefully, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I keep right. forward perfect. Hey, cool. Thank, Thank you so, so much for waiting. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. We I think we discussed such engaging points. Yes. Um, and I, I love the idea of kind of coming back and that's the accountability or impact that we spoke about. So I'm so <laughs> glad you guys are using it right away. True, true. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. Bye. Bye.